whole business of his big brother watching you and uh, we couldn't talk to anybody better positioned to tell us yes or no than Silky Carlo, who's a director at uh, Big Brother Watch. Hello, Silky. Hi, good evening, guys. Uh, are, are, we, uh, are we moving closer to 1984? I think maybe, you know, that threshold ha has even been passed. Oh, OK. Um, I mean... So let's look at the whole surveillance, you know, in answer to that question, we need to look at the whole surveillance context and um, we live in an environment in the UK where we're under constant surveillance, more surveillance than any society in the whole of human history has ever been under. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's as a result of government surveillance and international government surveillance. And then, you know, which is un under the spotlight right now is corporate surveillance like that from Facebook. Um, and Facebook itself conducts an extraordinarily broad and deep level of surveillance. So, you know, not only collecting the data that we give the platform or doing things, like you said, um, you know, even holding information about status updates that we start to type but then don't actually post. Um, but also then uh, combining that with offline data that it buys, and making a whole picture of us and then doing insight and, and analytics into that data that can not only, you know, understand our personalities and our psychological traits, but can predict um, behaviours as well. And then, you know, that really valuable data is available basically to the highest bidder. Hmm. Do you have any idea, um, and I'm not expecting you to because... I don't know whether y you are, um, are well versed in the technology of all of this, as well as you are obviously in the sort of philosophy and the morality of it. But do you have any idea how between me sending a phone text to my friend and producer Hayley, which she then receives on her phone, does that information go via some sort of robot software whatever which then is primed to pick up on certain words perhaps that are in that message that are then digested and then sent off to different buckets well i mean let me give you what's an example supposing i were to send a text to Haley and say shall we talk about mi5 on the show tonight and mi5 is one of those buzzwords that whoever is watching or listening might be watching out and listening for, how they know that I've sent her a message that includes the word MI5, and then mm. what happens to that information? Does that get put in lots of buckets? This is, these are two people who, are, who might be a danger to, to our country because they're talking about the secret services. Or mm. these are people who might be interested in the next James Bond film when it comes out. <laughs> yeah, uh, you might be surprised to hear this, um, but it doesn't matter what's in your text message. Yes, it's passively monitored, which means that it goes through um, our secret services um, monitoring processes. The what's called metadata, so the fact that you've texted Haley, for example, is stored for a year, and that storage pot, as you described it, is available to the police if they want to go in and access it. But what the intelligence agencies do with it is really um, anyone's guess, mm. because obviously that's highly classified. But looking at the, the legislation, which I've spent years doing and, and fighting and litigating as well, um, they have blank check powers to uh, monitor all of our communications. That's not just text messages. It's emails, it's voice calls, it's video calls, internet browsing. Um, and, you know, how this ties into the Facebook story as well, I think it, it is an important thing to say, that Facebook as a private company is a honeypot available for our security and intelligence agencies because the, the, the government, the UK government in particular, but, but practically more than any other government in the world, um, has such incredible blank check powers to take data sets from basically any company that it wants and also to break security systems. So 
when we look at the processing power that Facebook has and the two billion profiles that it has, let alone everyone else it's buying on around the world, um, all of that information is available to our intelligence agencies too. Um, and then to take that further, you know, another angle on this is that Cambridge Analytica is a shell company that's owned by um, a, a bigger group called SCL. And SCL is a military contractor that has contracts relating to um, data analytics, etc., with uh, the UK Ministry of Defence and allegedly uh, one of our intelligence agencies. Well, blimey. I did not know about 80% of that, and I'd like to think I keep abreast. So what do you do differently, then, on a personal level, Silky, with your technology that, um, that, that I, oblivious, and actually most people pretty oblivious, uh, should be thinking about doing as well? Yeah, I appreciate that, Tommy, because this stuff, this information isn't readily available for years. It was called... Um, anything from conspiracy theory to conjecture, but now we have this in black and white in statute, um, and it's being litigated. So, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's out in the open now, and I, but I appreciate that it's not the most public information. But certainly, if anyone's interested, have a look at Big Brother Watch, you know, our website or, or on Twitter, um, you know, where we try to disseminate some of this information. We also do monthly workshops, um, in London, unfortunately not further afield, but we, they're called crypto parties and that's where we try to teach people how you can reclaim some privacy in your everyday life there's simple mm. things like for example um there's an app called signal which allows you to do encrypted messaging voice calls and video calls really? and like whatsapp but bear in mind whatsapp is owned by facebook yeah yeah so all of the, the, not the content of your messages, but the fact that, you know, say, for example, if you WhatsApp Kaylee, yeah. that's the kind of data that, that then Facebook can so just get, Sorry, just go back a second, because I want to be clear that I understand this. You can actually download your own kind of Enigma machine. <laughs> yeah, that's my, the one way of looking at it. It's a very simple Ooh. piece of software. It's exactly like uh, WhatsApp, except for the fact that it's not owned by Facebook, and the code that goes into making the app is publicly available, which makes a huge difference because it means that we can audit it, we can look uh, whether there, look at whether there are any surveillance backdoors in it, which there aren't, um, and so we can have a higher level of trust in it than something like WhatsApp, which is a commercial piece of software owned mm. by Facebook. Of course, we have to say at some point in this conversation that besides all the things that we get quite understandably neurotic about um besides all of those things and that's fair and right and we should be vigilant uh, some good use is put to the collection of some of this data isn't it or not <laughs> well i what? don't see what good there can be in collecting the personal information of millions of innocent citizens that that is simply characteristic of an authoritarian society, uh, not a free society. And, you know, I strongly believe that people who are suspected of criminal activity and especially serious crimes, uh, paedophilia, terrorism, etc., should be under direct, acute surveillance. But that is a very different yeah, thing. But how do you know to... that they're planning those things unless you go trawling for general activity um people who are uh, considering committing terrorist acts or the other crimes that you mentioned they, they don't walk around with a sign on their forehead saying i'm a potential terrorist they have to be snooped um yeah uh, okay but th that doesn't involve intrusive surveillance on the mass scale that we're now seeing it, by by any shape or form. This is a total departure from the kind of democratic system that we've lived in. And the, the system that we currently have is the dystopian people spoke about throughout the 20th century, basically. Um, and that's the kind of reality that we're now living in. And, and never, ever before would anyone have thought that this would be an acceptable way for the UK government to behave, to collect, to, to monitor undersea cables carrying basically global internet traffic 
uh, monitoring everything that we do say and then effectively think. Mm. Um, so, you know, we're really, really in a in a strange place in the UK with, with surveillance at the moment, both state level and commercial. It's becoming almost inescapable. We're nearing a point of no return. Big Brother Watch is taking government to court on mass interception and we're to a, a judgment in the next couple of months, which I'm very, very confident will be successful. Um, but we'll see. You know, this is this is a big, big system, and we've just got to keep fighting it. How are you doing this? Are you targeting individual big players in this game? In terms of our legal challenge to mass surveillance, um, we've launched that legal challenge against the UK government. Oh, okay. um, that's a fairly big player. Yeah. <laughs> We make friends in the right places, clearly. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> it is very difficult to police something so big and so sort of Dodge City-like as the internet, isn't it? This has been a problem now for a long, long time that because it's it's uh, it, 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 nobody knows where is the server that is disseminating direct calls to action by potential terrorists. Nobody knows how to disable that. There are ways of doing it, though, and the extent of criminality in human society is, you know, obviously massive. And we saw just a, a week or so ago police saying that they're aware of thousands and thousands of paedophiles online, um, but they don't have the resources to go and arrest those people. You know, similarly, there, there have been uh, lots and lots of reports to police recently of, of sexual offences that aren't being investigated. So we've got a policing resource problem in the first instance. Um, but in, in, in terms of a, a much... Um, much, much, much rarer crime like terrorism, um, we, we simply cannot move towards living in a society where every citizen is treated as a potential citizen. Because, you know, if you follow that kind of logic and the kind of logic that I, I think was, was perhaps underlying your question about, you know, don't we need to monitor all of the internet to make sure that there aren't terrorists hiding in it? That is a suspect first, innocent later kind of kind of approach that really turns the democracy on its head. Hmm. That's the kind of logic that we saw in all sorts of authoritarian and totalitarian political systems in the 20th century. So, uh, th unfortunately, that is the direction that our government has, has taken and that hmm. has actually taken to a, a, a more extreme degree than any government in, in previous history. Yeah, yes, um, uh, I, 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 I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I, I entirely agree, but before I forget this point, because you're so interesting that as I'm listening to you, I think about eight things I want to ask you about in the course of any one of your um, that points that you're making. So what was it I was just thinking? That, oh, yes. I remember somebody once saying that um, if Kate Ad had been active and had access to the technology of the broadcast media uh, in the Christmas of 1914, the First World War would have been stopped dead in its tracks right there because people would have known exactly what was going on and i find myself just batting on behalf of the internet for a moment against you if you like saying that besides it's very important that we are not treated like citizens as you so eloquently said um the internet does have the opportunity to expose a great many activities that it's worth us knowing about and possibly therefore acting on so there is this, in, it's a bit like alcohol, you know, in the wrong hands, the internet is a terrible thing. But in the right hands, it, it can surely be a force for good. And so there is a balance there, isn't there, that we have to work really hard to achieve. Mm, Tommy, I absolutely agree. I'm pro-internet. <laughs> you know, I, I grew up at a time when, you know, it's, when my house finally got internet access, it was the most exciting thing, and I totally believe in the democratising potential of the internet. I really, really do. And that's kind of why, even more strongly, I feel that we need to push back very, very hard against government attempts to turn what was a really free and democratising space where we could share information into this kind of surveillance panopticon where everyone's watched and now increasingly censored as well, you know, with government attacks on, on not anything from so-called non-criminal extremism to 
unpopular and, and controversial view, views or even, you know, quote-unquote fake news or, or whatever mm-hmm. that is. Um, all, all these kind of a- attacks on, on this free flow of information as well, we really need to push back against. And, of course, you know, not only the, at the state level but uh, at the commercial level as well, the, the way that the Internet has been built on, at, at a commercial level, a surveillance model to uh, enable free platforms like Facebook uh, to to make profit. You're listening to Silky Carla, who's director of Big Brother Watch. Silky, we've got to listen to a couple of messages very quickly. Can I possibly ask Please. you, because I've thought of another couple of things I've got to ask you. Can I persuade you just to hang on for a little bit longer and stay with of us? Of course. Good, good on you. I'm Tommy Boyd, in for Ian Lee. This is Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Digital debate for the UK. Pick up your phone and talk radio. We'll get you talking. It's time. Time to join the millions of people that meet happy with Zoom video conferencing. With stunning HD video, crisp audio, and instant wireless sharing across any mobile, tablet, or desktop device. But the best thing about Zoom? It just works. So ditch the distractions, join the movement, and meet happy with Zoom video conferencing. Visit zoom.us to set up your free account today. That's zoom.us. Zoom video conferencing. Keeping your four wheels fresh (laughs) when you've got a four-legged friend... (laughs) can be a hairy business. Until now. Power Out Pet Mess Kit is the brilliant new product from Turtle Wax that keeps canine carrying cars clean. Whether you take your Vizna in a van, your hound in a hatchback, or your black lab in a black cab, Power Out Pet Mess Kit is the simple way to remove the unwanted hairs and odors pet passengers leave behind. Turtle Wax Power Out Pet Mess Kit. Trusted innovation inside and out. Available now from Euro Car Parts and all good retailers. At John Lewis, we have everything you need for the perfect Easter feast with 20% off selected John Lewis Classic Cookware and £150 off KitchenAid 125 Artisan Stand Mixers. Plus, from the 24th to the 27th of March, you can earn double points when you spend on your partnership card. Get together this Easter with John Lewis. Terms and conditions apply. See johnlewis.com for details. Partnership card representative 18.9% APR variable. Credits subject to status. You must be over 18 to apply. John Lewis Financial Services Limited. You can say anything to a mate. Anything. Call them every name under the sun. Wind them up. Bring them down a peg. Tell them stuff you never thought you'd tell anyone. Because they're proper mates. Like brothers. When it's a mate, you say what you feel like saying. Except, I love you, man. And I'm not going to let you drink drive. Stupid, isn't it? Mates don't let mates drink drive. Think. This is Nick from Insurango. Every October, the Mekong River releases balls of fire into the sky. Some people think it's a mystical serpent, the obvious answer. Some think it's methane gas, but scientists have poo-pooed this idea. Others think it could be man-made, but surely if it's man-made, someone would have come forward by now. It's been going on for centuries. I like to think that if the Thames started shooting fireballs into the sky, it would be properly looked into. For more travel trivia, and travel insurance of course, visit Insure and Go. Take us away with you. Across the UK, online and on DAB. Tommy. Tommy. Tommy Boyd. Tommy Boyd on Talk Radio. Talking to Silky Carlo, who's director of Big Brother Watch, and uh, Silky's hung on to talk a little bit longer. You can call um, if you want to, but um, it's kind of crowded with me, this one. 0344 499 1000 is the telephone number. Silky, what, what... If anything, should people do slightly differently to be on their guard about intrusive interest in their internet traffic? What do you do that the rest of us haven't thought of yet? Mm. Uh, Well, in the first instance, I would recommend downloading an app called Signal. Um, as I said, this is a, an encrypting, mm-hmm. uh, encrypted messaging app, which is a lot like Facebook, mm-hmm. um, but it's designed entirely to protect your privacy. It's free, uh, and I try to move uh, my conversations onto that app for people that I know who are, who are just on uh, WhatsApp. You know, I try to move the conversation over to Signal. Um, there are other things you can do. So there's a, a web browser called the Tor browser, T-O-R, and that anonymizes your web traffic in uh, such a way that it's very difficult to intercept or 
or monitor what you're doing online. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really a lifeline, especially for some of the journalists I work with and, and other human rights campaigners. Mm -hmm. um, that web browser is really important. So those are two free really accessible tools that you can use to do most of the things that we do electronically every day, which is basically make calls, mm. uh, exchange messages, and go on the internet. Right, without being obtrusive, um, I, I find myself wanting to ask things like, you know, whether you're an avid Facebook user. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to, but if you are, do you use it any differently from the way in which the other two billion people on Facebook do? I don't use Facebook. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not on the platform, but I think I, I think you ask a good question. You know, for, for people that aren't ready to leave, I would definitely recommend, um, you know, severely limiting some of the apps that might have gained access over the years, and particularly just thinking about the extent of the information that you share on there. Um, I mean, Facebook will very cleverly make inferences about the, the fragments of information you give it anyway and the other stuff that you do, whether online or offline. Now, hang on, you, you talk about those, these inferences and it almost smells to me like the beginnings of artificial intelligence. Yeah, Facebook does use artificial intelligence. Oh, here um, we go. For a number of reasons, yeah, and so that could be to identify accounts that it thinks are bots it's now using AI to identify accounts that it thinks are extremist. And what I have to stress with this, because I know, you know, like most people, no, no one really wants to be surrounded by you know, violent views or anything like that. But that, that's not what we're talking about with extremism. With extremism, we're talking about essentially fringe politics that people fear could turn into something else. It's not criminal. Uh, this isn't criminal activity. But yet Facebook is monitoring its platforms to try and find accounts that it thinks are on those fringes mm. uh, and then intervening with those people. We've also seen um, more moves recently using AI on platforms like Facebook and others mm. to um, de-rank content that it doesn't believe is authoritative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, you know, are we going to end up in a situation where on these big platforms we only get so-called authoritative news sources and that would really be to undermine the very purpose of the internet which i think was to broaden our horizons and increase the way that we share information and, and we don't want to be just recipients of basically state approved information but that's what we, we risk with this increasing ai mm. there, you know, there are other things as well that facebook has done that are probably worth mentioning uh for example it has a monitoring system that tries to identify people that it thinks might be depressed and suicidal, um, it, mm -hmm. which I find incredibly intrusive, but particularly for people that are looking for online expression and connection with friends and family in a way that they want to really, truly express themselves and how they really feel. Um, you know, probably don't want to be spied on and monitored as you do that, in which case Facebook probably isn't the place to do it. So they might be looking for people who have mental health problems in the beginning, because they want to help provide them with the right kind of medication and counselling or some other more nefarious purpose? Well, it, yeah, exactly. So the, the idea of the intervention with people that might be depressed and suicidal is to basically stage an intervention to ask them if they're okay and how they feel. But mm -hmm. Uh, that, it's just incredibly, do you want a for-profit company that certainly does not exist for your benefit or for your for your health to have that kind of information about you? Uh, well, if you're somebody, that. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, my, my, my thinking at the moment is, is quite clouded by uh, a, a person who has called this show last night and the night before, um, who is somebody who uh, is... is able to ad admit that he doesn't have anybody to talk to. And so he started calling NATO, the United Nations, and MI5 uh, to talk about an incident that happened in his life in Thailand some ten years ago. One of the things that the Internet, it seems to me, does is provide some sort of friendship or a social network for people who don't have the social network that humanity over the last two million years, say, has been able to enjoy, which was communal cave life to begin with, and then village life thereafter. And then up until perhaps the 50s or the 60s, you know, everybody knew everybody else's neighbour. But all that has changed enormously, and people are living their lives largely alone. 
And mm. staying with the very particular, I know, example uh, that, that you brought up, it could be that people who are beginning to move towards having difficulties, mental difficulties, uh, haven't got anybody else to talk to and don't have anybody in their lives who could say to them, perhaps you ought to go and see your GP. Mm. I, I think that's the benefit of a, of a social network, as you say, it totally is. But whether that's a role that a, a for-profit company that, that revolves around data exploitation like Facebook should play, or whether it's the role that an online community should play, yeah, okay. you know, those are two yep. really different things. Yep, yep, and and yep. just just for me to, you know, finally illustrate uh, why I'm so cynical about Facebook's role in well-being, a few years ago, it played a, a, a live experiment on its users, up to about a million users, um, manipulating people's news feeds covertly without their authorization or consent to see if they could make them feel happy or sad. Oh, so it was yeah. a, a mood manipulation experiment, which, mm. yeah, it sounds like you've heard of, yeah. which it was, I found that really disturbing. And I mm. think most Facebook users probably probably would find that really upsetting too. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I do remember that. So, um, close your Facebook account. Apparently there's a lot of it going on. Whether or not people want to close their accounts, it's a very, it's a personal decision that each individual should make, but I think it's really important that we make informed choices. Mm. And if there's one good thing that comes out of this scandal, it's that I think we finally privacy advocates like me and Big Brother Watch have managed to tell people, you know, this, this isn't a one-off. This isn't just Cambridge Analytica. And in fact, it's not even just Facebook. This is written into the fabric of the internet economy, which is basically uh, is, is driven by surveillance machinery. Um, and it's a much bigger problem. But saying that, there are things you can do. And Big Brother Watch, we really seek to share some of that information about the simple things you can do to be more private online and in your personal communications. And that's not only for our individual benefit, but as we've seen in this case, that's for the benefit of society and democratic norms at large. Silky, thank you so much. Thank you, Tommy. Lovely to speak to you. And you, Silky Carlo, who is uh, director at Big Brother Watch and 